Juniper Valley Sin Circuit. I don't know if any of you have read it, um, but a lot of my research came off of that. I am the curator of the Hayden Heritage Center Museum over in Hayden. Um, some of you have probably been there. Some of you are probably like, wow, there's a museum in Hayden. <laughs> we get that a lot. Um, they just make a go north from the new come and go, and we're down in a 102-year-old uh, historic Moffat Depot building, uh, which we recently had the roof restored through a Colorado uh, State Historic Grant and a Moffat Museum and Heritage Fund Board Grant, which is through Route County. Uh, we also just had our floors redone and we restored our weight room. We took out a big dividing wall thanks to Colorado Questers who Oh, there's Jane Romberg. A few of you are members of uh, Colorado Questers up here in Steamboat. Thank you. They did had the floors redone. Ace Hardware, Ace at the Curb. I know I saw Bridget somewhere, because I happen to work there as well. Um, they provided the paint and the supplies, thankfully. It's through a lot of our partners that we're able to get a lot of our projects done at our museum, because we're pretty small. Um, but please be sure to come by and check us out. Uh, we are open Tuesdays through Fridays right now, 11 to 5, and in the summer it's Tuesdays through Saturday, um, 11 to 5. I do have brochures, so if you ever want to make a little jaunt, about 25 mi minutes away, um, please do so. We have some events coming up, May 30th, Ride the Cog, June 27th, that's for you bike riders. Um, June 27th, we have the tour of the Elkhead Rock School. It's a huge fundraiser. We usually get Dorothy Wickedin, the executive editor of The New Yorker, to join us. We're waiting to hear back on that. Um, but it's a private tour. It's June 27th. We usually sell out pretty early. Um, she wrote the book. It's a New York Times bestseller, Nothing Daunted, if any of you have read that. Be sure to check it out. It's about school teachers in this area. July 19th, please mark your calendars. This is a Route County thing, the Route County Pioneer Picnic. We will be hosting it again this year. It goes around the county every two years. Um, it's free. Bring a side dish, uh, anything to share. But this year, we were very fortunate. Uh, the new owners of the site where the town and the mine works along the river, down from the memorial site along Highway 40, um, is allowing us use of the property. So we will be holding it down on the actual site of Mount Harris. We will have tours. We're going to um, have a bunch of stuff going on. Please check our website if you want one of these, which has our website on it, or one of our brochures. Feel free to come up and grab one afterwards. Um, so, from beyond that, now that I've done my shameless spiel, um, oh, and before I forget, I, I am shameless. So, I'm talking about shameless things. So, uh, our museum is working on a much needed expansion. If you come and you see our museum, you'll see why. Um, so if anybody would like a building named after them, please. We are open for large donations. We can really use it. Um, but we are. So funds, we greatly appreciate. So Now, on to my talk. Now, I changed this about 12 different times. So I'm a little bit random. Um, so I'm supposed to be talking about Rowdy Route County. Cannot talk about route, Rowdy Route, say that five times fast, route, Rowdy Route County. Um, I wasn't sure what direction to go in. My focus for my graduate work was on Brooklyn. Anybody here know where Brooklyn is? And, yes. So I did some in-depth studies about Brooklyn and of course the outlying town for my book. If any of you have read it, has anybody read it? Yeah. Yay! Okay. Um, so, spoiler alert, I'm going to be talking about a lot of these stories. Anyway, that was my mainstay. It was about 1900 to 
Prohibition, 1916. That was the rowdiest period of the saloon culture as we know it. Um, but there were some stories earlier than that about Route County, even before this was Route County. Um, the mountain men were out here in the 1840s. A lot wasn't said about them. They didn't exactly write things, although at our museum we do have a tree trunk that Kit Carson carved his name on, a dendronologist, yes, there are people who go to school to study trees, came and verified the date of the carving. And um, we know from diaries as well um, that Kit Carson came through the area. Uh, there was a fort, it's called Fort David Crockett. Uh, it was built about 1837, the following year um, after the Alamo. Three uh, mountain men built this little fort, which is nothing more than a little kind of lean-to uh, log cabin out in Browns Park, which would eventually, at that time it was Mexico, they didn't know that, but it was Mexico, um, which would later become part of the United States and later be Route County, and of course later even yet become Moffat County. But it's kind of part of our history. So, uh, those guys were out there. There was a rendezvous north of there, um, about 1839. It was one of the last rendezvous, um, which were wild parties. Really, they were trading fast for the Native Americans, sometimes upwards of 2,000 people, mostly Native Americans, mountain men, and some representatives of the fur companies would get together, and there was lots of whiskey. There was partying. There were games. It lasted for weeks. So I, I couldn't leave that out because that was kind of part of our history. Um, not much left of it, but kind of the earliest of the, the rowdy start to our Wild West. Um, after that, this area which we are in is relatively new. Um, it was really Indian territory until 1869. We had given it, the U.S. government had given it in perpetuity to the Utes, which lasted a few years. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently those don't always last very long. Um, but in 1869, the Kit Carson Treaty opened up um, a large portion, what are, now is Route County and Moffat County, going to Utah, um, to settlement. People didn't come in, they weren't racing to get into this area because of the proximity to the Ute Reservation down at Meeker. Ah, it's competition. <laughs> um, also, it was very difficult to get here. As many of you know, I rarely travel in the winter, but a lot of you probably go back and forth to Denver. It's not exactly easy even with our modern highways to get anywhere. Um, travel was very difficult. A lot of it was footpaths. So people didn't exactly come in here in droves. Uh, the Crawfords came in in 1875. The year before that, the Smarts came in with Thomas Isles, who settled out towards Craig with a small group of people. But it was pretty calm. These were early settlers. There wasn't a lot going on. At that point, they were just trying to survive. There wasn't a lot. At this time, this was Grand County, your nearest established courthouse was in Hot Sulphur Springs. That was where the nearest law was. So there isn't a lot about um, anything going on over in this area that would be considered lawless. Although a few people made complaints about some of the traders trading whiskey to the Indians, people such as the Smarts and Thompson over in Hayden, I guess they were kind of traded some whiskey for things, and as did Morgans and a few others. There was a rumor, which I do not have any verification of, of one of the old mountain men setting up a still and selling whiskey out of a cave. I have yet to find this cave. <laughs> it's one of those rumors that eventually you track down and you try to find some kind of written historical information on, but this early history, there wasn't much. We didn't even have a newspaper, we had nothing really, except for a few letters that were written by some of the early settlers. 
who a good portion of left in 1879 after the Meeker Massacre, or Meeker Incident. A lot of times it's referred to as the massacre. Um, a lot of people made a run for it, uh, and a few stayed behind. So it really didn't have much wildness. There were a few saloons after this, 1880s. We really had the towns coming into um, their own. People, the new settlers, started building towns. And there was rumors of the railroad coming. Now, to be honest, during this time, before the towns really got going, gambling was not illegal. Whiskey was not illegal. Prostitution was not illegal. The only things that were illegal was if you were out and being lewd or drunk and disorderly. So, these things really weren't talked about. There were a few saloons, there was a few shootings before. Um, 1897 was the year that we had a shootout down at Hayden. I know, Hayden's not a huge town, but there was the Joe Jones Saloon, which the building is still standing, and I, I believe the town now owns. And there was a bunch of cowboys in, a few of them um, started up a game of cards, and they started fighting, and one of them was a John Og, and he started shooting because he thought he was cheated, and he was so drunk, he really, he didn't hit anything, but the gentleman he was playing with was a good shot and shot him dead. <laughs> now I've heard rumors that, that uh, they buried the guy underneath the, um, the walk paths of the town, but that's not true. He was buried up in the cemetery, um, which is probably a good thing. But there really weren't these gunfights like you would imagine. I don't know if any of you, I grew up watching Little House on the Prairie, Gunsmoke, Bonanza, and you always saw those westerns with Miss Kitty and, and uh, the cowboys calling them out, you know, at noon we're gonna have this gunfight, you know, walk 12 paces. It didn't really happen here. These were really spur of the moment events that didn't always end well for one party or another. Usually nobody was killed. There was just shots fired and uh, bullets ended up in walls. <laughs> so it wasn't a totally vicious area. Um, we did have some outlaws in this area. I think everybody knows Butch Cassidy and uh, Sundance and the Hole in the Wall gang. We had Tom Horn coming through. Uh, the gentleman who shot was involved with that uh, gunfight with Mr. Ogg, who he shot. Um, William Sawtell was a cattle rustler. We had a lot of those people come through here. Um, generally, if somebody caught them and didn't like what they were doing, they were running out of town. Uh, we didn't really have many, much in the hanging departments either. I mean, we were Wild West, but we were pretty mellow Wild West. Um, up until about 1900, it was just about building up the towns, getting everything going. Then, about 1903, a gentleman by the name of David Moffat, who was a railroad magnate and a millionaire, which was a lot back then, not quite now, uh, in Denver, decided he had been looking at this area for building a railroad, a transcontinental railroad that would compete with the Union Pacific and with the others, the Southern Railroads. Um, and so he was gonna build it through this area. That's when the real boom came through this area. That's when the spec speculators came through, that's when the saloon men came through, and that's when they brought the prostitutes through. So I wasn't really clear on what everybody wanted to hear about. Usually people want to hear about the prostitutes. <laughs> Seems to be the, the general consensus. People are really interested in the, the ladies. Um, but the saloon men, they were important parts of building up the town and the towns along the way. And I just always found Steamboat very interesting in this. 
steamboat was dry. So right now, you would not be able to have your beer. You'd have to go to Brooklyn. Because the good people of Steamboat wanted to be, they were, at that time, I think that was the Protestant um, kind of take on things, that alcohol was bad. There was a growing movement called the Progressives that really uh, saw alcohol as the evil to all of society's ills. You know, people are getting drunk, kind of like today now with the drugs. Um, but what they wanted was they wanted a town that was nice and quiet. And a lot of reasons for this is that this was cowboy area. So you had cowboys that were out on the range, they'd come into towns, and when they came into towns, they weren't that quiet when they'd come into towns. They'd come into towns rowdy, they wanted a beer, they wanted to spend their money, they were looking for girls, they wanted to have fun, they were boys, they were young men that were rowdy and rambunctious. A lot of their life was rambunctious. They broke horses. Sometimes they did it in the middle of town. <laughs> this was frowned upon. People didn't want that going on on their city streets. More women were coming, more families. They wanted it nice and quiet. And here's these rambunctious cowboys. And then you had more immigrants coming into town. A lot of them were Irish and of other persuasions. They liked to have their drinks too. And so the town fathers were like, oh man, we want to create this, this utopia and we want it to be a resort town. Ooh, a resort town. Oh, we don't want to like tick people off. We want people want to come here. So we, we kind of want to attract that group that would like to have alcohol and cigars and a little bit of gambling. So how do we have that in our cake too? Well, let's stick them all over in Brooklyn across the river. Then we can have that area where there's alcohol and fun and we can be dry and we can have our streets quiet. Solved a lot of problems. Also, which is what I wrote a lot about my graduate work on, is the money, the revenue. There's some serious money to all of this. I knew I'd knock something over. That's why everybody stands back when they see me talking. Um, so I had to write this down because I'm bad with numbers. Math was never my forte. That's why I was a history major. Um, at this time, to start with, they started the licenses for a saloon at $500 a year. That eh, doesn't sound too bad right now, right? $500? Well, if you go back to those days, the average person made 22 cents an hour. So $500 was the equivalent of $13,000 for a yearly license. Eventually, by the time, right before Prohibition, they were charging $1,500 a year for a license, the equivalent of $40,000. There was some big money into this. The gentlemen who were able to start these saloons, the Gus Durbins, the Shorty Andersons, the Lev McAlpines, they had slowly made their way in front of the railroad. As the railroad came through from Walcott and moved its way up into Route County, they moved their businesses. And they would move their businesses from town to town to town, waiting for these groups of men to come through because the railroad employed about 500 men to do the survey and to do the preliminary work. Another thousand would come through, building it, the blasting, the digging. Everything was done by hand at this time. You didn't have all this machinery. You had large groups of men who were making money and were kind of stuck working in these camps as it moved along. So when they would get paid, they would go into the nearest town where the gentlemen like Shirley Anderson and Gus Durbin could fleece them for all of their wages. They provided them with entertainment, with alcohol. You could get a, uh, let's see, a Budweiser for a quarter, which was an hour's wage. So that would be like what nowadays, minimum wage, about 15 bucks. Uh, you could find some companionship with a young lady. Um, food, cigars, 
So that's how they kind of employed this all, and they made their money. And then they took their money and they invested it, because they knew these towns were going to grow, and they invested it in things like sawmills, because towns needed wood to build up the different buildings, build up the saloons as they burned down. Um, they needed uh, plaster for the walls, so they had uh, lime. Lime is used in making plaster. And so they started all these businesses, and these guys were kind of like, they could belong to different things. They could be political, not like the ladies. The ladies were kind of like pariahs of society. But these guys, they could join lodges, they could go to church, they could be you know, on the city governments, they could do whatever they wanted. Of course, the women who worked for them couldn't. They kind of had to be hidden in the background. <laughs> Um, but nobody really fought too much against the ladies at first because they were felt that they were a necessary evil. And this was a common feeling up until this time, that prostitution was a necessary evil. That was a, um, a quote given by a newspaper. Few newspapers wrote about this, that we needed these type of places so that young men can sow their oats and it would safeguard good girls. It would keep them from, since there was a little bit of law and so much lawlessness, this would keep their virt virtual, eh, keep their, uh, can't even think of the word, keep their virtue safe on the street so they didn't have to worry about being accosted. These men could go to prostitutes. The other thing was at this time, no birth control, women were basically married and bred to death. You had a baby every year, you know? So a lot of wives were like, oh, you know, here's five dollars, go away. <laughs> they did for a little while, you know? It, it was kind of one of those, they didn't like it, but it was like, oh, you know, the last thing I need is, you know, I've got 12, I don't need mo no more. And of course, mortality rates were high, things, you didn't have hospitals like nowadays, you were giving birth on your kitchen table. So, you know, it was a rough life. Um, so they kind of turned the other cheek. They didn't allow these women in good society. These women were pariahs to them. They were like, ooh, don't touch me. Um, Jean Wren had written about it. There was one lady and Withers, Dorothy Withers, she had talked about how her mother had, she had looked at one of the women and she walked up to him, and the woman looked at her and said, oh, what a beautiful little girl. And her mother grabbed her, like, oh, don't touch her, you know, like the evil will like, wipe off on you. So these women just, they didn't have the ability to <laughs> join in society. So a lot of their stories are lost. A lot of them are buried up in our cemetery. I don't know if any, any of you have been up there in the swampy section. That's where a lot of those women are buried in unmarked graves because, well, they were just barely allowed to even be there. Um, I probably went off on a tangent, I usually do. Um, but, so that's how this area was. You had these saloon districts where things could happen, anything could go. Um, that happened in a lot of the towns, uh, Craig. They had their saloons too, they were downtown. There was always stories of little shootings and little incidents. Um, there was a hotel that was raided um, as a brothel. That was a huge story over there because the lady fought back and filed a slander suit against the, um, the newspaper. But this happened quite a bit around. Um, a lot of people ask, well, why did these girls do this? Why, why did this even happen? Um, and a lot of it has to do with, they didn't have, a lot of the women, as I was doing my research, I found out a lot of them had been abandoned by their husbands. Their husbands had taken off and left them. There was nothing for them. There was no social services to help them out. There was no jobs for women. Rarely would a woman get a job. Um, they could teach if they were unmarried, um, but once, you know, a woman was up here and she was kind of left on her own, she had to make do, either get married or 
figure something out. Go to the church, beg, whatever. So a few of the inmates that were over in Brooklyn were ladies who were married, but their husbands had left them. Some of them were girls that wanted to make good money. Uh, I did find one young lady that was up here working down in Oak Creek for a time. Uh, she had also been a worker down in the factories. So she went from a factory making like 25 cents an hour to working as a sporting girl making much more than that in an hour. Um, so there was that economic um, thing that a lot of girls were like, you know what? I can be a rental wife, make tons of money, dress pretty, eh, nobody's going to talk to me in good society. Oh well, maybe I'll meet a cowboy and he'll whisk me off and save me. Or I'll just have fun while it lasts. The average lifespan during this time was 47. So life was short. Um, there was once a ah, gentleman, he's very Habesian. Life was short, nasty, and brutish. And that was a lot of people's concept. I think we don't live with that same thought process that death is right there. Back then, it was. You didn't have, um, I always love that movie, what is a million and one ways to die in the West? Because there were a million and one ways to die. You didn't have antibiotics. You know, you got a scratch, you could die from it. You know, you, could, you got a cold, you could die from it. There was dysentery, typhoid, you name it. They were building outhouses on creeks and people were getting sick. <laughs> Kept down the smell. Wasn't exactly good for your neighbor. Um, but there was a lot of this. And I digress. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the saloons, everything kind of closed down in 1916. Things went uh, dry in this area. A lot of towns were able to go dry a little sooner than that, although they didn't. Um, there are lots of stories of bootleggers. People were finding bootleg uh, stills well into the 1940s and 1950s up in the uh, uh, National Forest. There was a rumor uh, of a gentleman down by Sydney. Anybody familiar where Sydney is, out in Pleasant Valley? The gentleman would sell maps, and he buried casks of whiskey out in different spots and he would sell you a map because he didn't want to get caught by the G-men. Uh, and so he'd sell you this map and you had to find it. And I've heard rumors of people, you know, going to plow an area and finding a cask of whiskey. Like, <laughs> middle of nowhere, what, what's this cask of whiskey doing? So, you never know, you might find one of those. And probably still be good, I guess. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so lots of stories of bootlegging, um, which is what I was just going to share, some weird stories, random stories. There was uh, an elderly gentleman who came, I, I won't give his name because he's still alive, I believe, barely. He might have passed away last year, he doesn't live around here. And he told about how when he was 12 years old, he was rather tall for his age, um, he was hired to drive between Dixon and um, where alcohol was still legal and Hayden area. And he would make these drives over bu bumpy roads with a whole bunch of booze in the back of an old vehicle. And he had a block on the, on the gas pedal. And he was always a little fearful of getting caught, but he got paid really well. So there was a lot of bootlegging going on in this area. Um, but by 1916, a lot of the ladies were moved down, the, the saloons were shut down, um, although a few people got caught saying that they had whiskey, they had to get rid of it, and they were still drinking it, you know, come uh, January 1st, 1916, they had big parties over in Brooklyn. Um, I'm open for questions. I will babble on and on and on. That is usually what I do. Um, does anybody have any questions? You make it sound like Brooklyn was so <coughs> far away from the steamboat. You know, it, so <laughs> it was, and the bridge was down, you know where Rabbit Ears Hotel is? The bridge was down there. Okay. Um, and then it got moved over to the Fifth Street Bridge. So where did the prostitutes 
did they live in like rooming houses there? And they did. did. They, did they have the credit? They had rooming houses. There were two well-known rooming houses. Um, one was Ollie uh, Patterson. The other one was Hazel McGuire's. There was also ladies who worked for themselves. It was a lot more dangerous to work for yourself because once the door closed, there was nobody to protect you. Um, so there was a, a few of those kind of cribs. There wasn't the same hierarchy as you would see in the cities. In the cities, you would have these illustrious uh, places, sporting houses that had, uh, one of them was rumored to have paintings worth $10,000, and they'd have young ladies, you know, they'd have Miss Frenchie who did kinky things. They would have different young ladies who dressed very fine, and they would entertain the men. Here it was a little rougher, you know, but it wasn't so rough, it wasn't like a hog farm. <laughs> Yeah, you know, there were hog farms where, it, with prostitution, you didn't go up the ladder, you went down the ladder. So you're worth more when you were young, average ages were between thir 13 and 50. So while you were young, they, uh, the average cost for a young girl who could pass for a virgin numerous times was $50. And then you kind of went down to the ladies who were in the back alleys, like uh, five cents a poke. Um, but here it was pretty moderate. We didn't have those hog farms. They had hog farms up in Wyoming. And those were like little cribs where the girls kind of hung out the windows uh, and yelled for guys yelling obscenities, showing their legs. They were in their nightgowns. They, they were rough. They were very rough. <laughs> uh, those, uh, it was kind of, you kind of went down to that level eventually your future was being a street walker if you didn't find another opportunity get married go somewhere else um, that was all you were left with so but here there were nice little rooming houses the ladies dressed very nicely there's lots of talk um, in some of the newspapers about fresh young ladies they changed them out a couple of months uh, the uh, ladies who ran the hotels would go to Denver, bring up new ladies, take the other ones back. So they had fresh goods. So the young ladies would dress up. They'd walk through town showing off their wares to attract men to come over the bridge. Um, and it wasn't too bad, although, um, of course, disease and violence. Like, uh, yeah, disease is the... And when the wives would ask the husbands, go ahead, wouldn't they bring back some stuff? They would, and I often wondered, I always wanted to go down that bunny trail because there was a high incidence of suicides in Steamboat. There was a few ladies that one day just went to their back garage, at one lady, and hung herself. And there was a few ladies that perished pretty early. Um, I know, Paul, you're gonna shake your head because Andy Black, I think was one of your favorites down in Oak Creek, but Andy Black was one of the men who would show up with a new wife at events. He was notorious for hanging out with Hazel McGuire, one of the ladies who owned a rooming house. Hazel died of syphilis, complications from syphilis. She was only 36 years old. Late stage syphilis is, um, uh, basically she died in a poor house in the insanity. She lost her facilities at only 36, so most likely she had it and passed it on. Some people can be carriers, and uh, Andy did eventually marry, and his wife died very young. So, but there wasn't talk. They didn't do inquiries and put it in the post, you know, that, oh, well, this is so-and-so just died of syphilis. <laughs> Um, they didn't really talk about that. Bright's disease killed a lot of people, which um, was probably from urinary tract infections that were probably um, from changing sexual partners. Um, and then there was the cures. Those could kill you too. They would inject uh, mercury into parts of your body that you didn't want to do that. I don't think you want to inject mercury in any part of your body, but they would do like Collateral silver, there's whole books on that. It'll make you cringe. It really will. <laughs> I, I didn't get into that in my book. I kind of 
glossed over that. It was just kind of an introductory to some of the history. Get you some of the stories. That was one of the things I like, is if you don't have it. It's got all the stories. There's some murders in there. Um, any other questions? The one who did, who was very successful, was Ollie. Oh, the question was, what, did any of the women become successful? Did they become millionaires? Now, I don't know if they were quite millionaires. I didn't look at their tax records. But Ollie Patterson did, she got out of the business. You know, she probably was only a prostitute for a very short period. She took up with wealthy men and then had prostitutes. Those were the women that did the most success, the ones that ran the girls. Um, she did, when she passed away, she owned uh, interest in quite a few mining companies, local mining companies. She owned two touring cars, one for herself and her, her husband that she met. And uh, she put her kids through private school. That was something a lot of prostitutes did do. If they had children, that was something that happened. The good ladies of a town, instead of saying, well, we should help you and get you on your feet, they generally would take the children from the women and leave the women in their situation. So a lot of prostitutes, especially if they were successful, would send their children off to private schools. There's one story of a, a lady in, in Arizona, quite successful, she became a madam, she had tons of money, she sent her son to elite schools back east. He never knew. When he did finally find out, he cut her out of his life, even though she paid for all of his education and paid, afforded his expensive lifestyle, it was not you couldn't associate with it. It brought you down. Nowadays, we don't have that kind of stratification. I guess there is some stratification. Yes. There, you know, I, I, I guess I have to say that. But at this time, you were brought down. If you, if you were caught as a young lady of good standing, if you were caught talking to one of these young ladies who were, as Mr. Burroughs would say, um, out sunbathing and cleaning in the river and showing off their legs, smoking cigarettes. You were looked at as contaminated. You were bad. You probably wouldn't get a good husband. You'd end up marrying the guy, cross-eyed guy down the street. You didn't have any money. Um, it really ruined your prospects. Um, so it was all about standing. Keep in mind, I brought this book. This was a world of etiquette and rules. This book right here is a book on etiquette, 1896. This is all the rules, just from what you sh how you should dress in the morning, for lunch, for dinner, when you go out, how many gloves you should have, how many petticoats a good girl wears underneath her skirt, um, how you should talk to people who you should associate with, how you should behave, how you should speak. All of this told you exactly how to act. Can you imagine that? I mean, like, you'd have to be walking around just constantly, oh no, what did you say? Oh, how do I act? But a lot of people had this memorized. One of them is keep good company, do not hang out with these people that would bring you down.
Well, as far as the ladies, the ladies did step up, especially in the small mining communities, which was really fun when I was doing some of my background work. In some of those smaller mining communities, like Alma, um, Georgetown, all those little gold communities, a lot of those places, the only women that were there were prostitutes. They weren't necessarily called prostitutes in the early stages of people moving westward. Uh, a lot of census workers got a little tongue in cheek and they called them horizontal workers. Uh, there was a rash of mattress inspectors um, in one gold mining town. I like ceiling inspector, so you know what that girl did. Um, so, but these young ladies, a lot of them would kick in. A lot of them did take care of their, cust their customers or clientele uh, because they were small areas and they were they knew each other. You know, they're going to take care of each other. Um, and so, during a lot of epidemics, there are vast stories of young ladies going in and caring for people. Uh, especially the miners during disasters or during um, sickness. The second thing was the judicial. A lot of people turned a blind eye until the progressives and the Women's Temperance League really kicked in and until a lot of good standing women came. Um, it was kind of like, mm, you know, it really wasn't illegal. So if the women were running downtown, like one young lady uh, went through, um, I don't know, she got in a lark, she was probably way drunk. She was in her underwear, which at that time was more than most teenagers wear nowadays. <laughs> um, you know, if they have their bloomers. She was in her, bloom, her knickers and her, um, her corset and her little top and smoking a cigarette, riding a horse through town. Might have been a bet, she might have lost a bet. Um, that kind of behavior got you fined generally $50 to $100. Lewd behavior was $100. Uh, beyond that, they usually didn't go after them too hardcore um, in the judicial part. There was an incident where um, a couple of young ladies um, and a couple of gentlemen went fishing with dynamite and they got caught. Um, they did some things that were just like, what were you thinking, you know? Um, of course you're gonna get caught and fined. They generally didn't spend any time in jail or prison. You never saw women go off to prison because of prostitution. They paid their fine, they were back out in the street. Generally, if, if the town didn't like them, they could get railroaded out and sent on the train, but they didn't go off to prison. Um, the judges, you know, if, if they were brought in front of them, they had to uphold the law in front of their constituency, but generally it was just fines. Um, there was a judge here, and off the top of my head, um, I can't remember, but he was going senile, and he sat down one day and blew himself up with dynamite. That was something that occurred here. Had nothing to do with prostitutes, sorry. I, you know, butterfly. Sometimes the stories just come out. What was the situation in Mount Harris? Mount Harris, there was four towns between Milner and Hayden that are no longer in existence. If you look on old maps, they were company coal mining towns. Uh, at that time, they brought in a lot of people from Eastern Europe, uh, Italians, they had a lot of people from Mexico, um, Norwegians, they weren't really looked on highly either. Um, anybody who was an immigrant wasn't looked on very well. Um, and so there was Mount Harris, had over 2,000 people at one point. These towns ran from about 1914 to about the 1920s through the 50s. They slowly left. So right there at Milner, um, you turn off to go to the Milner Mall. Everybody familiar with the Milner, Milner Mall? <laughs> I hope I'm not the only garbage picker here. Because um, they have some cool stuff out there. You gotta go out there. Um, there was a town called McGregor uh, there. Uh, that was a coal camp. They had a power plant there. We're all talking about power plants right now. That, was, that served the western Colorado. It's gone, nobody even remembers. Um, the next town heading towards Hayden would have been Coalview across the river on the south side. Then you had Bear River. 
and then you had Mount Harris. And we have like a little pull-off our museum cares for. Um, all of those were company pole camps. They had uh, pool halls. They had saloons. Um, the one in McGregor, after Prohibition, they hid all the booze in the school basement, and then the kids found it. Like, they couldn't see that. And first, you know, that kind of tipped off the sheriff. All these drunk kids running around. Um, they tried to keep alcohol out, but a lot of the saloon men got really clever. You know, this is before Prohibition. They would think of ideas, like, how can we make money? This is a time of really creative, capitalism. You had a guy um, who got a tent, grabbed a couple of prostitutes and a couple of kegs of uh, alcohol and went over to Mount Harris and set up camp like just a ways from it and then went into town, gave out flyers and got people to come and made a bunch of money till he got run off. He got uh, fined by the sheriff. Um, there's a guy at Oscar, I can't think of his na last name, um, he was a saloon man in Brooklyn and also in Columbine, everybody know where Columbine is, north of Hans Peak? He got the idea that they kept having these uh, sheep, sheep uh, where all the sheep herders would bring the sheep in and they would have, they would brand and cut out the lambs and you know, it was like a big roundup. He was like, hmm. Yeah, that's a lot of guys in a small area. He went to Brooklyn, grabbed a couple of prostitutes, ran them up there with some alcohol. Um, sheep were going all over the place, running amok, and the National Forest, Mr. Uh, Ratliff, Ratcliffe, went up there and was like, what? You know, they got sheep everywhere. They're all mixed up, all the herds. You know, we're supposed to keep track of all this. And here's like three prostitutes making a ton of money. You know, until the beer ran out. Uh, rumor had it that he grabbed the lead woman and tied her to a tree and cut off her hair with a hatchet and kept it in his office as a ward, never to come back again into his forest. Um, he was also rumored to have gone to Columbine, where there was a few huts with some right. young ladies in it, and he ran those ladies, made them walk all the way to the Wyoming border. Whether or not that one's true, I'm not sure. He definitely did end up with the ones with the sheep because it took like three weeks to straighten out all the different sheep. It's kind of a little bit of a little bit of a nightmare there, but I guess everybody had a good time, you know. Um, any other questions? Um, a lot of the people went on after this. They left. Um, in my book, I kind of talk about, I tried to trace down different people, what happened to them, because that's how I kind of work. I'm really interested in the people and their stories. Um, there are other incidences of violence, shootings, but pretty much the, the majority of the naughty behavior was the saloons, Brooklyn, you know. Fun story was a politician who was walking down the street didn't realize Gus Durbin, another gentleman who owned a saloon over in uh, Brooklyn, had decided to um, kind of up his game, and he would deliver alcohol. So I'm not sure how that wasn't illegal, but he could call and get it delivered. So he used his wagon to do this. He also would bring people over, so you could ride in the wagon over to Brooklyn. And this guy thought, oh, he's giving me a free ride. He sat on the back of the booze wagon, as many people referred to it. He was from Hans Peak. He wasn't aware. He's waving to people. People are pointing at him. They're like, what are you doing? And he's like, hey, oh, look, these people love me. They all know me. Look, everybody's pointing at me. Until he ended up over in Brooklyn, and then he had to do the walk of shame over the bridge as everybody looked at him like, oh, we know what you were doing. There was a rumor, I never found out this is true, this is told to me by Mel, Mel Hitchens, about a group of women who got so mad about their husbands going over into uh, Brooklyn that they went over there one night with bats. They were gonna burn it down. 
and of course the sheriff shooed them away. And after that, a lot of husbands, instead of going over the bridge, which was like an obvious, they're going over, um, they would sneak across rolling up their pants. And so you would hear these stories of domestic abuse on men who had wet pant legs. Because the women knew. It's like, no, 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 you were crossing the river. You gotcha, you know? Because they're drunk, so they probably fell in the river. Um, well, that was about the most random I've probably been in a while. Um, I even put this in really big font because I, I have to wear glasses, so I really can't even really see most of it. Um, just like the CR is. Um, but if anybody else has any questions. Oh. Nineteen sixteen. Uh, it went completely dry. No, I mean, what did they allow in Steamboat? Oh, in Steamboat, they were over there. They didn't make it illegal until like about nineteen. I want to say oh four. When they saw so that the railroad was going to be coming. Um, well, prohibition was federally turned around. What in thirty? 33, something like that. It's a little out of my error. It's too hard. <laughs> um, but yeah, then it, you know, it was okay. But you could have a gallon of whiskey. I always found this funny, is that all these women who ran around, whiskey's bad, you know, whiskey's bad, it's ruining everybody. They drank these liniments and these pick-me-up, pep, put a little pep in your step, uh, tonic. And as a museum curator, I get a lot of these boxes. This is my grandma's, and it's like, wow, these are all this one tonic. You know, and you look it up, you do research on stuff, and you find out these pick me up for your female. If you, you're having aches or you, you need a little droop, you have a little droop, you want to pick up. These tonics that a lot of women were using were, I mean, Elvis didn't do that much drugs. I mean, they had, it's like you read the ingredients and it was codeine, um, what else, uh, alcohol, um, opium. They'd throw in, laudanum was huge, and uh, they would throw in a little like castor oil, which probably really made it good. Um, we all know what castor oil does. And then they would throw in a few herbs, like, oh, this is really healthy. Yes, as you take that dose of laudanum, you know. And they would take this quite a bit, which is kind of frightening when you think about it. Uh, but it did put pep in their step. There was cocaine and Coca-Cola yeah. at that time, so a lot of things weren't illegal, you know, like they are today. Well, if you have any questions, uh, feel free. I do have my book. That's my comment. You can tell them. I know I, I volunteered the book of ideas. I know we saw your book there. And I'm sure you saw it at your business. And there's pictures. I'm doing a book signing in Craig um, this next Saturday at the bookstore in Craig. There's only one bookstore in Craig, so I don't know how else to call it. Um, it's across from the museum. Um, the bookstore downtown has it. The museums all carry it. Um, I've got two here. If anyone's interested, they're twenty dollars, um, and it goes to a good cause to our museum, as do any of the others, as all the other museums. Um, and it's a fun read. Uh, I had a gentleman come up to me at the Route County Fair. I don't know if I should even tell this one. Uh, he came up to me and he was like, great book. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I was like, oh, you know, it's, it's my first book. You know, it was based on my graduate work. And I was like, oh, thank you. And he was like, it was the per those chapters were the perfect read in the bathroom. So I was like, OK, I'll take it. You know, I mean, I, you know, I'm shameless. I'll take it. But it gets the history out, fun stories. I'm not into too much of the heavy drug information. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't see you. Oh, yeah. Laudanum. Any of that stuff wasn't really illegal. Um, a lot of drugs weren't illegal at that time. 
Um, you had to also buy alcohol at the drugstore too. And fuel. For some reason they sold fuel at drugstores, which is kind of scary. Um, but yeah, well, things weren't as regulated. This was the wild west. Yeah, it was before they did studies on things. So I want to thank you. Um, thank you.